So, uh, so this uh, panel is supposed to be a discussion between me and Caesar on mapping, and I'm in no way an expert on cartography or um, the conceptual framework of cartography. Um, and I, I wanted to show some images that we shot in Papua New Guinea, but unfortunately I've been traveling consistently for, for quite a while now and I haven't had access to, to my hard drives. So what I had to do, um, especially after getting Steffi's prompt about being lively and, and not using PowerPoint, um, I, I gathered some images that I've been thinking about, um, my, my own kind of current, uh, and I've spliced them together and, and shared some thoughts about uh, how I approach mapping. Um, and ironically, I did all this on the plane traveling while I was here, so please excuse any technical roughness. Colors and lines projected onto planes of finite dimension. Maps try hard to suggest the infinite, barely failing, always coming close. Forty years ago, thousands of Vietnamese boat people embarked on fishing boats headed towards the oceans with no maps in hand. Were they blind or brave? Were they afraid that maps would not get them to where they needed to go? Or were they afraid the maps would betray them? Because it was the idea of a map that got them into this predicament in the first place. Or because maps could contain a concept of leaving from, but only traveling to. Or maybe because they knew that maps look back at us. They ask us where we are. Where will we be going? They ask us why. They ask us who we are. Why will we be going? They act. They are actors. They play the role of your faithful ally, your travel companion, your guide, your shaman. They proclaim you are here, and they render you an invisible spot on their landscape of logic. You scale yourself up or down depending on how you want to navigate. You zoom in and out to find yourself. You move left and right to locate yourself. The maps move as you move. They begin to dance as you dance. They mine. Maps become mirrors. In that way, we think they are inclusive. They are not. They overly simplify. They are fleeting. They are stuck while our landscape changes. Our landscapes change. My map looks back at me with an eye, like the eye of a camera, questioning my desire to see and not see questioning my desire to remember and to forget. Maps are both memory and language. For memory and language are places both of sameness and otherness, dwelling and traveling. Because the map wants to see as much of what it attempts to depict as possible, it will convince you to keep moving, to keep exploring, to keep pushing forward. It wants to convince you that it is telling the truth. It has to keep growing. And in so doing, it devours itself. Because the truth is infinite, and the map is finite. Because the map is a frame, and when it gets to the edge, there is nothing left to do but to fold in on itself. The map poses like the camera on that selfie stick. It looks at me, looking back at it, looking at me, both trying to figure out which angle renders the best background, the best backdrop where we don't seem like strangers to the photo, to the map, or to the place, but where we still look like we've come far in our travels to get there. <laughs>
Now, in October of 1929, Halil Edhem, the director of the Tepkapi Palace Library in Istanbul, discovered a fragment of a map drawn on the gazelle skin and its bundles of materials that have been long discarded. The finding, which quickly drew international intrigue, marked the historical reawakening of a figure whose contributions to navigation, geography, and cartography have since then been contested as some of the most significant of his time. Ottoman Admiral Piriris drafted the lines and symbols and texts on that 1513 parchment, whose survival has made it one of the oldest existing maps of the New World. Now, few uncontested facts exist about Piri Reef. His story, like his work, is an obscure collection of truths and fictions, recalled by many who encountered him and many others who never did. Although not an explorer himself, Reese compiled navigation techniques and created cartographic records deemed highly accurate during his lifetime, using the labors of other explorers. Elegant and sophisticated, compositions depicting bodies of water and swaths of lands old and new. Reese's maps bear witness to humanity's insatiable curiosity about the world and our place in it, to the fears and desires that have driven our species' urge to make tangible all we cannot see, to our sometimes peaceful but most often violent necessity to rid ourselves of the other, the distant there, the unknown, by shaping circumstances we can control. Now the maps that were made by Rees are as much as a amassments of discoveries as they are failures. And in retrospect, we see coastlines that should have been longer and islands that could have been out of place. But these inaccuracies do not underscore the historical importance of Rees's works. What they do reveal, however, is their profound human quality. Maps are far from truthful representations of the world we live in. They mediate where others have been, what they've seen and what they've experienced. They are emotional and purposeful, subjective and specific. They manifest on paper as scars of, that remain after struggles of power and they survive as relics that emerge from the search. They become endpoints of dreams and possibilities. As an uncomfortable union between science and an art form, maps are never truly immediate. They're never really present. They give us other realities, always elsewhere. Cartography for us, um, and we started with these, that was sort of an introduction I put together for Marcus and Francesca before the current had the form that it actually did. And over the past couple of days, we've been hearing a lot about the scientific dimensions of the oceans and sort of the trips that Uta has done to French Polynesia and the nuclear impact. But my expeditions have been quite different. And my expeditions have been as much informed by the lives that are in the ocean as by the lives that oceans help sustain and create, about communities that live with the water, with a particular intimacy that most of us are never going to fully be able to understand and exist with. So there's a human dimension, and we've been talking a lot in our expeditions about the realm of the subjective, about empathy and compassion, and about things that have really sort of emerged out of these moments of contact that we've experienced. So what we wanted to do today is, is talk a little bit about the process of these expeditions, because I only done one so far to Papua New Guinea, but also to talk a little bit about how they were structured because I had a, the incredible opportunity to be in dialogue and to think with Marcus and Francesca before the current assumed its current form. So I was familiar with many iterations of what this project could have been but never was. And that inevitably informed the way I approached organizing my particular expeditions because there was a moment of transition between thinking about the structure of the project and then inhabiting the form it actually ended up taking. So I was really fascinated by the idea of the project itself and about what it meant for a platform like this to exist. And when and mapping became sort of a guiding concept rather than a structure for it, it became an idea that I wanted to 
to sort of commit to and think about because as the language got refined and the mission statement got to put together, I started thinking in a very self-reflexive way about what it actually meant to construct a platform that aimed to birth a new species of sort of curatorial or exhibitionary spatiality. And then what kinds of responsibilities come with creating a platform grounded in discovery whose ultimate you know, end is inevitably finding new systems that become paradigms that we then again are tasked to rechange and transform again and again. So that's sort of how the process began for me in terms of the current. And thinking about the map um, in particular, these are sort of beautiful illustrations and they're incredible sort of artworks, but they're also quite flat and linear. And when I was talking, sort of conceptualizing the project, um, I really wanted my sort of three expeditions and convenings to think about how we can create a new form of map, how we can add volume, considering we're looking at the ocean, how we could add depth, texture, how we can harmonize a map, how the map could move beyond the realm of the, of the sort of uh, two-dimensional inscription and exist as a multiplicity of forms of arc writing, that the map could be gestures that were performed, made melodic, inhabited, or embodied. And if we could achieve that, then can a project like The Current achieve its aims of creating new forms of knowledge that maybe help us renegotiate our relationship to the world we inhabit and to its living beings, both human and other than human, by transforming relationships between thought forms, humans, and objects. Um, despite thinking about the map that way, my first proposal for the convening was a map. Um, and, a, and I started with a very particular structure that each expedition would tackle on a certain form of translation. The first one would look at how through touch and smell and the senses we translated the environment into, into the realm of the cognitive and then how different ideas emerged from that and how knowledge production happened. And the third expedition would look at how those thought forms could become applicable through design-oriented solutions. And then the boat came and then the map fell apart when the artist came on board. Um, it's been a very humbling experience to be in the ocean as someone who's struggling with their own relationship to the water. Um, I am not a swimmer, a strong swimmer. I mean, I'm swimming now. Um, uh, but, but the, and bringing people into a space that has very tangible physical impacts for you and, and that inevitably affect the way you think. Um, there are moments of really intense critical intimacy that happen in these spaces where you're trying to not be cheesy and, I mean, for lack of a better word, or, or, or sort of give in to the nostalgia and the romanticism around ideas of exploration, but at the same time learn that this can't happen in a vacuum and from a complete place of an observer. That there's a human element that is as important to the processes that are unfolding in this boat. Um, and so when the artist came on board, the structure fell apart. And it re the actual project forced me to surrender a little bit of the authorial relationship that curators have to exhibition projects. Um, and it's been one of the most generative experiences. It also helps when you're gifted the opportunity to spend time and work with brilliant artists and something that happened with the convening, which is what hopefully our dialogue will be today, because it's still information, so this is so much an exercise about thinking in public, um, is how the structure and how all of this gets connected over time. The Propeller Group is an artist collective based in Vietnam, um, originally from Los Angeles. I met them when they all were practicing at sort of individual artists whose work sort of navigates a multiplicity of spaces. Um, they moved to Vietnam to start a commercial production company, and they circulated these different spheres um, in very interesting ways, from creating advertising campaigns to launching a, a, a sort of national rebranding for, for Vietnam with, with a world tour. Um, to rethinking the idea of the ethnographic film at the intersection of like the music video and, and sort of video art. 
Um, and one of the things when, when the propeller group came on the boat was that they inevitably started changing the way that I thought um, about how this all can connect. And now the structure of this of my particular itinerary within the current is guided by my collaborating artists. And in particular, the propeller group who assumed the role of pseudo-cartographers in a way to connect all the different aspects and dimensions of participants. So one of them, all three of them came on the trip to Papua New Guinea. One of them will continue to come on each expedition. And I'm gonna have Tuan talk a little bit about what that means for an artist to sort of help create these kinds of inhabitable or spatial forms that unfold over time. We've been thinking a lot about the archipelago as a structure for this itinerary, not necessarily as projects that are cited within different temporalities, and how, through artistic interventions, they can be called upon or invoked when necessary. So I'll let Tuan talk a little bit about um, how the propeller group is approaching mapping, and then we'll talk a little bit about specifics for Papua New Guinea and Coach. So, it's been a very enlightening kind of uh, experience over the last couple of days hearing everybody talk about um, freedoms of the sea and, and how the sea gives life. And, but, but what happens when you see the sea as a, as a window towards freedom? What happens when you see the, wind, the sea as uh, a moment of possible death? Um, we, before we, we depart, and actually it was a very intense trip for us because we really didn't know what we were, were getting into. And, you know, I think uh, Selena mentioned yesterday how we have to kind of unframe our experiences. Um, but it didn't occur to us until, you know, months after our expedition to Papua New Guinea that we travel, our point of departure, our points of embarkation, frames the way we travel, and it frames the way we see, it frames what we see, it frames how we look, it frames how we record, it frames how we capture. Um, so I, I just wanted to share another video that I um, finished on the airplane um, about our, a very kind of local relationship to the ocean, and how this relationship to the ocean kind of uh, catalyzes a very politicized relationship to, to um, related uh, to, the, to the government and to the ocean as well. Um, so again, please bear with me about this video. At first, it's hard to make out a speck on the horizon. You take a closer look. A boat, a flag, an arm wave, a crowd gathers along the beach. This is the east coast of Malaysia, final destination for thousands of refugees fleeing Vietnam. Many don't make it this far. They're attacked by pirates, drowned, or starved to death. These have made it, but will the Malaysian police turn them away? Or will they be stoned by local villagers? The crowd waits to see how many will survive this time. Charges in Malaysia have thrown another boat of Vietnamese refugees out to sea. It's the third boat in two days that's been set adrift. <coughs> like the others, it's unseaworthy and overcrowded. China has put out a nine-dash line. It's called the cow's dung because that's the shape that it defines. It covers about 80% of the water and the territory and the land features in the South China Sea, which is shared by a number of other countries, including four other Southeast Asian claimants, and also by Taiwan. And it is one of the most dangerous claims made by any country in the world today because China is trying to close off the South China Sea. The Chinese claim 90% of the South China Sea as their sovereign territory. We cannot accept that. This is an honorable, very dangerous situation between the United States and China. And if they are aggressively seeking to intercept U.S. ships or aircraft, then accidents can occur. We're dealing with the major 
arteries for globalization. This is an area of vast maritime trade, uh, both energy but also trade in general. All the nations of this region depend on the sea lines of communication for their economic well-being. These are uh, highways through which enormous volumes of maritime traffic pass. More than a third of global trade goes through the South China Sea. And uh, if China wants to become the dominant player in the region, I think from the perspective of Chinese strategists, it's important for them to be able to control the use of those waters. They see the United States now as having that capacity and that role, and they would like to have it themselves. Hundreds of people staged were protests in Vietnam over the government's slow response to the mysterious mass death of fish along the country's central coast. Protesters in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City claimed on May 1st that Taiwan's Formosa Plastics, which operates a steel plant in Vietnam, is behind the death of many tons of fish. They urged communist leaders to expel the company from the country because of a supposed role in one of the worst environmental disasters ever experienced in Vietnam. Large numbers of dead fish have been washing ashore since April 6 across a 124-mile stretch of coast. <laughs> fishing that, um, that has been of tremendous kind of um, impact on, on Vietnam socially, culturally, um, economically. And I haven't seen Vietnam and, and Vietnamese people protest in this way before. Um, but the protests have not been allowed to happen. Uh, so, you know, people are, are finding ways to protest um, that they're, they're finding alternate ways to protest. And uh, this is a collaboration that I did with a local Vietnamese rapper. And this is our way of like finding protest. Uh,
I just wanted to show that video as like a, a way we, we ingest images and we ingest the concerns that we have and how we reimagine these images and how we, we reimagine, how we remake these images. And I think that was, that was our, they were very much on our minds as we were traveling with Caesar to Papua New Guinea. Um, we, we understood the problematics of going into areas like Papua New Guinea um, and, and starting to film images. That was, that was a big issue on our minds and so maybe this conversation can unpack some of those concerns. Um, I'm also glad that we started with this because this wasn't sort of very clear to me when I came on the boat until after we had, about a month after we came out with the first expedition, uh, the Propaganda has a quite interesting relationship to the sea because of where they geographically, I think, conceptually work from. Um, and the history of the sea as a, as a particular persona um, that a lot of people in Vietnam have a very sort of intimate, personal, charged relationship with as a point of departure, but also as a place of longing. And as we encounter people who live with this kind of intimacy, it sort of began to click and make sense that there could be some interesting conversations that happen here. What's also fascinating to me about their practice, and you've just seen a little snippet of what they do, but from the mute, from literally a rapper's music video to a campaign to rebrand communism uh, done by a very sort of by machine of advertising that fuels the capitalist economy to a campaign to re to the world, you know, Vietnam, the world tour, to rethink how nationalism can be redone. They create different kinds of spheres that are different kinds of spaces as part of their practice that, that are always sort of in conversation with each other. And as I was thinking about how this was going to be connected, um, their ability to do that came to the forefront. So I wanted to ask you, Tony, if you can tell us a little bit about what you did for those who weren't on the boat, what you did when we were in Papua New Guinea, and some of the ideas that, or some of the things that you guys are thinking about that are also new to me, and I think for those of us who were on the boat with them, we saw the cameras, and, but we're not quite sure what's going to happen with whatever they filmed or how they filmed us. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you usually begin these collaborations in these different kinds of spaces? How you know if it's going to be something leaning towards a music video space, a long sort of print format? How do you guys assemble this? And how, what are you guys think, doing with the work that you did in Papua New Guinea? A lot of our projects 
are involving our local community. Like we are very much engaged in uh, the community, the, the different communities in Vietnam, the different sub subcultures in Vietnam. So to suddenly be in a different location, um, attempting very hard to work with a different community in a very short time, that was very, very difficult for us. Um, and I remember, Caesar, before we got onto the boat, you had this agenda of every night reading ethnographic texts as a way of reflecting on our position and, and how we're moving through these spaces. Um, and I also remember all of us being very seasick. And, and that, you know, that leads me to kind of think about how the body moves through the sea, on the sea, and under the sea, and how, how grueling it is for some of us who, who aren't used to it. It's a very taxing experience. It's very corporeal. Um, and so eventually we, we didn't read these texts, and we didn't discuss the text because we were dealing with our seasickness. Um, and, and, you know, after having been through it and then reflecting on our experiences on that first expedition, it occurred to me that, you know, when we think of the map and we think of how we look, we, we look through the map and we, we look at the map and we imagine our bodies in that map, on that map. And while we're on these expeditions, we, we look and we, uh, we make these interactions with the, with the locals on the, on the islands and in the villages. And it seemed, and, and it feels like each interaction, each meeting becomes a voyage in and of itself. Um, I wish we had more time with, on some of the locations and some, on some of the islands, but I think that was the biggest challenge of the expedition, was the time element. Why did you take out the camera and start filming us and start filming Francesca and Marques and the crew and myself? Because I think it's something that inevitably we've, we've sort of tried to figure out that to think about what the ethics of visiting are um, and to think about these other histories of exploration. And I know that there were these really intense moments of being uncomfortable, but at the same time having these really intimate experiences with people there. So how did you navigate that sort of sense of uncomfortable and thinking about the space of cultural tourism and its complexities and not letting that paralyze you in terms of being able to have actual genuine exchanges with people. Because the camera came out significantly. Um, it was, there was two different views and two different visions almost in conversation with each other that made it very uncomfortable at times for everybody else on the boat, but you were complicit with that. Why did you decide to do that and to reverse the camera like that? I like what Mario was saying about how Alan Sikula kind of implicates himself in the image. Um, it was a very interesting situation on the boat because there was all, also a documentary team, a team of documentary filmmakers who were filming um, all the actions of the, the artist and the, and the expedition leader. Um, and there was you know, beside, and it was uncomfortable, but there were also very intimate moments on that boat. There was a certain kind of depend dependency um, and a certain kind of intimacy when you travel together, uh, especially on the ocean. And there's a lot of looking. <laughs> and for us, as trained filmmakers, we, we wanted to make that kind of looking apparent. We wanted to bring it to the surface and the, and the best and only way we thought to do so was to look through an apparatus and to make that looking very apparent. Um, yeah. What well, was most fascinating to me about the experience is that in the beginning, and, and I, had, I actually had a little bit of a head start because I got to come on the boat to Vanuatu before Papua New Guinea. So I, I was already mentally prepared for the seasickness and the other physical complexities that come with it. But when the documentary crew was on board, you exist on the boat either as an observer and you see them recording somebody else and you're participating in that process of seeing somebody else, 
or you're participating by being the person with the camera. But the moment that both film crews went on, you guys were able to sort of crystallize this participant observer experience where you were always wearing both hats simultaneously. Um, which inevitably brought on to the current, these broader histories of anthropology that I think ended up grounding a lot of our thinking when we were on the boat. Um, there were some moments where we were invited to participate in certain dances or we met other sort of people, but this anthropological sort of subtext clinged on pretty firmly for the duration of the, of the expedition for us and even after. And as we're thinking about Kochi, it's also become the base of how we translate these ideas. Because more and more, as we think about a map or charting this, or what happens at the end of three years besides the ocean pavilion? What, it, what, what's left in the, in the world is an index of these particular singular and collective itineraries that unfold. Thinking about you know, how, what, are, what comes out of that, the purpose of these convenings has shifted for us. Um, for me, a little bit, I think for, for the, my, my fellows who've been coming on the boat, because the one-to-one -one direct translation becomes much, much more complicated. How do we bring these ideas of Papua New Guinea when you enter into a village with 50 people who want to know about water sustainability, and how do you connect them to Kochi as a symbolic site for the beginning of the Law of the Sea or these early histories of capitalism that are dependent on water? And the one-to-one -one translation didn't necessarily, it felt very anthropological to us like going to a field, to the field, going to do field work, translating it in some, through some method, and then having something packageable and exportable to be sent and consumed. But for us, the idea is that not necessarily uniting a one-to-one -one translation, but using some of these broader concepts that emerge from the experiences of the fellows, from my own experiences, from the experiences of the pe people involved in the academy, and Ute, who, you know, we've sort of had conversations about this, and using these broader ideas to create shared, um, or to talk about shared experiences and conditions. And that for us has become the site that I think we're gonna try to play with in Kochi because the idea of how do you add a human element to this has become quite important and also quite frustrating because for those of us that are sort of trained as ideas of, you know, it is a very emotional experience to come on the boat. And there are certain moments that you feel insignificant in the most incredible ways. And for somebody who's trained as an academic, and not to write it, always write in the third person, to be distanced and to be forced into a space where that becomes very impossible. It generates a very different way of thinking and a, a different kind of responsibility for what this project should, should attempt to do. So for us, in, in a particular expedition, it's become about the human element in this, what are the human stakes? Um, and, it's, it, and it's sort of always at the foreground. And I always sort of hear, you know, there's not enough scientists on your expedition troops, or where does the science come in? And it, but it is inevitably, for us, has become a, a story, a project about people. Um, so that being said, can you tell me a little bit about how through your project, or through what you're thinking about for Kochi, we're gonna create a circumstance, or help instigate a circumstance that doesn't necessarily try to do a one-to-one -one translation of these relationships into the Pacific, but create common grounds for shared experiences and relationships with the ocean. Sorry, Cedar, before, before we talk about that, I, I really wanted to, to kind of hear you talk about your, your choice for Papua New Guinea, because that also informs these relationships um, that we have as people to, to people, right? These people-people relationships. And it was a very conscious decision as well. It was. Um, and Marcus gave me like, a, he said, where do you want to go? Which was really strange. And, <laughs> and, and, and Papua New Guinea, I think that um, when I was thinking before, right when I sort of assumed the role of you know, one of the expedition leaders, I was still in that transition space where I had just sort of been thinking with Marcus and Francesca about the structure of what this was actually going to look like. So the idea of the map as a metaphor for 
histories of knowledge making, and all of the sort of ideals that the current tries to do, like creating new sort of methods of knowledge production, thinking about new kinds of exhibition formats. I was thinking very much about that. And for me, Papua New Guinea has been such a charged site in the history of anthropological, of, you know, anthropological learning, or the, the sort of intellectual history of anthropology. It's a very violent history. And hearing a mission of rethinking the culture of exploration, thinking about other ways of being and knowing, inevitably acknowledging the violent histories that come with that urge to explore, um, was very important for my first expedition. And Papua New Guinea for me sort of crystallized a lot of these complexities. And most so because the conditions of the country now are inevitably echoes of these histories of empire, colonialism, and extraction um, that, have more, that have sort of forged the, the way that people live there. Um, a lot of people, you know, I have people, I invited people who didn't want to go because they said it was too violent. Um, or they said, are you going to have security? There's pirates. <coughs> Where are you going to go? Um, eventually, the brave ones that made it out, I mean, we were here, so it was, it was, we were okay. But it was a very difficult site. I mean, the two days that you spend in Port Moresby, mm -hmm. afraid to leave your hotel because you're not quite sure what's happening, there is a tangible anxiety that you feel throughout this. And as you're engaging with other people, um, so that's why the decision for me was Papua New Guinea it sort of crystallized a lot of these, a lot of these subtexts that weren't necessarily in the mission of the current, but that inevitably are part of these histories of knowledge making. They're very violent. The text is very violent. Um, it was very nice to hear about ancestral knowledges and thinking about other ways, but also being aware that how do we sort of do that ethically? Like ethics is a is an interesting you know thing for me to think about as we're talking about knowledge making particularly in the humanities, um, rather than sort of appropriating these, these, these other wisdoms. Um, and, looking, and looking now, now looking back on our expedition in Papua New Guinea, how do you think that that violence was navigated on our side? Um, you know, it, it, this is something that I keep going back and forth on because and we had these very intense conversations on the boat, and I don't know if the, something I'm fascinated to hear about the other expedition participants who went elsewhere, but this lingering feeling of what it meant for us to be able to be there. When we, I'm never gonna forget one of the sites where the boat dropped anchor, and we were all, we all came outside, and by the time we came outside, there were like 20, 30 boats with people around us right away because I haven't seen a boat like this in seven to three years. And you're going to places that don't even have sort of big harbors for, for these boats to come into. And there's a very uncomfortable reality. Of, it, it is a moment, you always sort of think about moments of cultural contact in a very distanced way, right? I think of Cortez coming in too. Like, you, know, you think of, like there's this imaginary around the moment of contact. And then you realize that these moments of contact are actually much more immediate than you than you think, right? And, but for this, this felt in a way, it felt very close and very far away. It really, for me, was a, you know, I, 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 it, I'm I, sort of trained anthropologically. Um, I decided to work with anthropologists rather than art historians um, in, my, in graduate school, but I never did field work like that. I was studying institutions and I was studying like art schools and I was as sort of entities. So then coming into the site was very unsettling. Um, and it continues to be a part of the conversation that I haven't figured out and I think about all the time. I'm always very hyperly aware of what it means for us to be able to be there and at the same time navigate us not getting drowned in that because it can become very easy to drown in that self-reflexiveness and then not allow yourself to actually have genuine exchanges with people which I think Christopher Myers, who came on the boat, was very good in dealing with and being aware of these things and, and yet actually having human moments with other people. But I know that it was uncomfortable for you. I know that it was uncomfortable for the rest of the fellow group. So it's something we're still sort of navigating and, and trying to think about how we engage in process of knowledge making, aware of this history, but in a way that's productive and not paralyzing. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I, I live in Vietnam, and, and almost every day 
I mean, I go to work on a motorbike, and tourists come to Vietnam to see the scene of like a, an ocean of motorbikes traveling through the city, and there's people standing on the corners taking photos of you. Mm -hmm. And and so I'm, I'm, I have to kind of engage and, and come face to face with this kind of looking every day as I'm riding my motorbike and being photographed by my tourists. And, you know, you, you feel like a monkey, you know, you feel like a, a, an animal in the zoo. Um, and, and knowing that experience, you know, viscerally, and then wanting to look and wanting to capture, because, you know, we, we, we engaged and we came to very beautiful images while we were on the expedition. It was, there was a beauty all around and there's an aesthetic kind of seduction um, that, that we engage in every day as filmmakers, but it was exceptional on Papua New Guinea. And to think about what it means to, to pull out a camera and, and record people was, um, was, was not comfortable. It was not a comfortable situation for us. Um, and our, we, we shot a lot because that's just what we're disciplined to do. But, there was only a few shots that, out of our whole entire expedition, that we felt worked. And there was one, one very long... Okay, so let me back up a second. We're it's, also, the time, yeah, so. it's also important for us, you know, when we're in these situations, um, and we discussed it amongst ourselves, that the camera has to move. The camera cannot stand still. Um, because there's an engagement physically, uh, not only with us as filmmakers in that physical space, but there's an engagement physically when the viewer sees through the image and the image is moving along with um, the subject of the image. And that was very important for us. And there was only one, one image that I thought captured our whole entire expedition. And it was when we were on Boga Boga and we, um, we were guided by, by one of the only one of two people who spoke English on the island uh, to to the watering hole. They have a they have a water crisis. Even though it's, they're surrounded by water, they're an island in a vast ocean. But there's a water crisis on the island, and uh, he wanted to show us the watering hole where they get fresh water. And one of the children who um, Chris had painted before, he decided to follow us. And so we decided to get a following shot of the of the of Redford is is uh, the child's name, the kid's name. Um, walking to the watering hole, taking a sip of water, and walking back to the village. And it's a super long shot, it's like 20 minutes. And, and that was the only image that I thought wasn't problematic in our whole entire Um We're running out of time, but I want to go, go back to Kochi really fast and just give a preview before we open up to a few questions. but. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're thinking in terms of this translating this experience in a way that makes sense in Kochi, um, in terms of some of the framework that we put together around why we decided to go to India and its sort of history as a major port and its relationship to love, see. But what are you thinking about in terms of connecting that those ideas that emerge rather than the experience, but the ideas that emerge from Papua New Guinea into the project you're developing for the for the next convenience? You know, honestly, we're, we're not quite sure, and that's complete honesty in front of all of you. But, um, you know, one of the ideas was to engage with uh, the fellows from our side and, and the fellows from Uta's side to kind of reenact scenes. And I think we also wanted to kind of engage with the local filming community. There's a strong film community in, in Kochi and in India in, in the surrounding areas. And we wanted to engage some of these local filmmakers and film students to kind of look at us looking. Um, I have no details. I don't know how that's going to play out. I don't know the, how that's going to unfold. But these are some of the ideas that we've been talking about. Questions from the audience? Yeah. Oh, wow. Sandra. I don't know if it's fair or not, but I'm, I'm confused. Uh, <laughs> no. 
always come. Um, do they know the people you meet in your exchange of culture? Uh, it, it sounds to me that we are in the time of uh, the, the Spain going to Chile, going around and, and call it Chile because it's the name of a bird, but actually it was uh, the name of the Mapudungun who talked to the Spanish. He said, What is this? It's all this Chile. But that was a bird. Oh, this is Chile. <laughs> And do they know that uh, PNG is one of the leading countries in deep sea mining? <coughs> How do they relate to this? Just to get, I think partially they know in the area where it's happening, and I think uh, another, but another issue that we experienced when we were there is like there was hope of oil drilling happening, and there was disappointment. It's not happening. I think that was for us a discovery to understand, you know, like when we heard in, in Boga Boga actually when they told us there's this oil, they, they came to measure like the ocean and they, they look up if there's possibilities of drilling. We said we have to go back the next day and interview them. this is ridiculous, we have to support them. This is not that this is not happening and then we came back and so like they're so disappointed that they hope they come back and drill, and now it's almost two years and nobody started to drill. Then we got confused and irritated, because of course there is also, which we said yesterday, that it, like, we have to see, and, and, and Boris brought up, um, economy, um, distribution of wealth, etc. While Papua New Guinea has uh, till 800 <coughs> languages, they're actively spoken, the highest kind of diversity of the world. Of course there is also poverty. Specifically, since the mines are there, there are inequalities, and there's a lot of, we talked also about ancestral knowledge, which is now partially used to bypass other laws in order to support mining. You know, so it's really very complicated. So I would say some of the people know, some decision makers, of course, know, others don't know. And it depends on where you visit, because one of the one of the things, really fascinating things about this trip is I think we went to one one sort of place, one location, the last uh, where like there was actually like a harbor that they're used to getting tourists, and the experience there was very different. But the majority of the time, like the boat is setting anchor, and you're going into places where they haven't seen people like this, or you know, they told. I remember that was really an uncomfortable comment where they're like, "We haven't seen the boat. We haven't seen people like this in two years." So you're going, and so that sort of information, or they'll have people who come and then they leave, right? And then they're never, so the idea of building also this kind of relationship was even strange with us, because Christopher Myers who came on the boat and was drawing everybody, and people said, you know, how do we get these pictures? Or they wanted us to get the photographs right there and then and go print them on the boat and bring them back, because there was no assurance that we were ever going to come back. So there's this also this distrust of, you know, I need this sort of now. <laughs> I, I have a question um, regarding the filmic practice of the Propeller Group in relation to the current. Because I'm confused by your telling, and you talked a lot about the discomfort and um, the binded relationship of, of being sort of shot back or shooting back. Um, but what was, what was the conceptual framework? I mean, what, what did you do with the material? How did you plan it? And, and, a little bit sounded like, well, you know, the cameras were rolling and we'll see what happens. But, um, so can you be more precise about that? Like, I can try. I don't know if it'll be a successful attempt, but, you know, in, in the filmmaking process, you go on what they call a recce, a reconnaissance trip, using very military terminology, where you go and you visit the sites and you, you engage in the community and you kind of spend time there and you learn and you, you become part of the community. And that's been our practice in the, in the past. Um, and that's a very important kind of part of our process. Um, whether it's working with the advertising community or with the hip hop community, with underground communities, whatever it is, we spend a lot of time and investment engaged with the community before we even take out a camera. But in this situation, we are, because of the structure, you know, it's. It's not a situation where we can do that. Um, so we had to we had to navigate, you know, what with what the, the conceptual uh, apparatus, 
this conceptual platform was, we, we were winging it, basically. Angelique, uh, yes. uh oh. <laughs> Um, <laughs> 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 Go ahead. Well, I, well, I like to <laughs> so um, the problem with these uh, art biennales is that they kind of tend to reduce everything to zero as if there's like nothing else that has happened. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I am, you know, I think Kochi Biennale is probably quite interesting or whatever, but you know. India does actually have a very rigorous and long history of uh, filmmaking that is uh, really like spat in the face of ethnographic filmmaking and anthropology, like God knows how many years ago. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, I'd like to know what filmmakers uh, you reference or you think about from India, um, if you've seen any filmmakers uh, work from Kerala, not necessarily artists, but you know, if you're going to talk about filmmaking, then let's talk about filmmakers. Um, and uh, also this uh, question of looking, and the, I mean, what is, the, what is the urgency in all of this, apart from one's own kind of personal journey into uh, this kind of identity search? Um, what is the, um, what is urgent in all of this for you? I think the urgency kind of rests in the urgency of the whole project. Uh, and that is an urgency to kind of bring attention to, to some of these stories that we've been sharing, we've been hearing in the last couple of days. Um, for us, we ask ourselves that same question, Angelique. Yeah. What is the urgency? I, and, and we're taking a lot of time to process our position and, and the way we've navigated this this this, this expedition. Um. The, the also interesting thing about this project, curatorially, is that it almost feels like you're doing the research process and the exhibition at the same time. And so your research process and certain things like this, or certain events that happen at convenings happen in relationship to an audience, whereas normally in a Biennale or an exhibition you would have this sort of moment of build up and thinking and assembling these resources that then get formatted. And here in a strange way, it happens at once. And it's also a really nice way of working because it's allowed us to bring other people into a structure that, thanks to TVA21, has a set parameters of us delivering a particular kind of product, which at the same time is a little frustrating because assessing what what we're sort of working towards. Um, in terms of, of India, where I am quite aware of the history of filmmaking, and it's one of those situations where we're able to bring in people to help develop a particular program. Somebody that I'm inviting to India to do that is Dr. Parna Sharma. She teaches in my department in World Arts and Cultures and has been working in the graphic film in India for a very long time. Um, and she's sort of helping me develop and a, a, project or a, a particular set of workshops and classes that she'll run with people like she's been doing for 15 years that will sort of get assumed into the structure of the convening rather than bringing people in and out. Okay, but they already exist. And that's what I'm trying to say. They exist there already in Kerala and in other parts of India. Uh, filmmaking communities already exist. Um, let's say, I don't want to call them communities, let's say, I don't even want to call them networks. I want to call I mean, this is a group, for instance, all over India called the Cult, that uh, really struggle to meet and really struggle to like, uh, exchange kind of forms of uh, political um, knowledge regarding the film making. But it's nothing, they're nothing to do with the uh, kind of international art world, or they're not being brought, they're not sort of even open to being brought in. This, I find this language a little bit imperialistic, kind of, you know, so, I mean, which part of the language do you have? Just this idea of going somewhere and bringing people in and ethno ethnography and these kind of terms. Um, sorry. <laughs> but I'm being very honest. Yeah, no, but, I, I um, think that's what this whole discussion has been about, completely. Um, yeah, I think it'd be great to tap in. I mean, we've, we've tried to engage in a discussion or try to contact Amar Kanwar to, to lo you know, to get us in touch with um, filmmakers that are there in India. Like I was saying, it'd be great to 
to talk to you as well if you have any contacts to local members. Well. But but it is part of of you know I think that the, the language and part of what why I was asking Tom if he could talk about that being comfortable is because even traveling to Papua New Guinea and I mean Mar I know Mark is a participant we've had these conversations mm -hmm. it it can be very paralyzing because we are hyperly aware that the we're existing in a very particular position that most people like can't participate in. And I think that we're <coughs> trying to figure out a way of having these exchanges, but I, we struggle with that too. So we're trying- But this know, is an invitation, you could also deny. You know, it's a choice. Yeah. It's a choice. The bulls are out on the table. Yeah. And um, there is a possibility to protest. You don't have to engage. We saw that you're struggling you choose to bring out the camera. You know, I mean, it's like, it's new forms of being annoying. You could say, this is, this is my discipline. I'm not using it, you know? You learned how to swim. You, you, you found a new way of being. You learned how to swim. You know, the, so, um, I, think, I think it's one to describe, and, and all these, uh, all these, uh, implications are there. Everything that you're saying is there. This is obviously the history. We're traveling with this history. Um, but the question is, how do we engage differently? What do we make out of this? So, and then there is this. There is this time lapse between when you go, when you engage, and when you when you are uncomfortable. And what do you make out of it? You know, that's these are kind of the rules, or these are the possibilities that are in there. Yeah, I think one, one of the things that, sorry, no, no, go, go ahead. ahead. One of the things that was remarkable about the trip, and you know, even going back, I wouldn't not go on this trip. Um, you are forced out of your context. And I think that's what, you know, artists need to do. That's what they want to do. That's what they inspire to do. Um, you're forced to see things complete in completely different ways than you're used to, and you're forced to question yourself. And I think that's the most important part of the expedition: is to continuously, constantly question yourself and your position. Well, no, no, no doubt about that. And I think you know, both as curators and, and practitioners, and what, what we've been doing in the past decade or more is creating alliances, you know, connecting places, thoughts, ways of thinking, sensibilities, ontologies, you know, beyond the realms that we had known until then. And I think our own practice has only shown us as much as, um, you know, we had available. But basically, there are sets of tools. You know, it's not that we have no tools that allow us to sort of navigate these interconnections. And specifically, for instance, if we mention Amar Kanwar, I mean, Amar, if starts a project or he engages, doesn't start a project, right? I mean, like, we know how slowly he starts to even think about and, 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 and approach and build relationships. And I'll not speak for him, but um, I, I suppose a lot of people know that. Yeah? So um, there, there are models that have been thought, you know, I'm not sure which model you want to choose for yourself, but I think one does have to abide on, by some sort of a a set of systematics, right? Um, because the traps are too big, you know, and they're, they're in the language, they're in the behavior, they're in the outcome, and obviously they just become bigger, right? Because it's like one's that unresolved. And, you know, I have the same issues. If I do a project with an estimate on the Huni Queen, and, and, you know, there's this whole thing of having uh, a group of, of, of Huni Queen. Uh, in, in the American sort of come to Vienna, I mean, what am I doing here, right? So I, I need to set up some sort of parameters for this type of relationship to function, uh, and they will set up a set of parameters, you know, before they come to Vienna. But that's a ground on which some, an operation like this um, can, can be somehow, you know, developed, yeah? I, I, I'm not saying held at, at, at eyebrows or at eye level, and eye level but um, so anyway, this is just my comment. I think. Yeah. I think. I'd also just like to respond to this a little bit. What you um, were saying before, um, when we started on this journey, 
last year, and um, we really didn't know the areas that we were going to. Um, we were all wanted to go to Papua New Guinea. Some didn't because you had to take, I don't know how many vaccinations as well. But um, we didn't know anybody in, in Papua New Guinea. We had no contacts there. I worked really, really hard through some people that I'd met in New Zealand to try and be introduced somehow. <coughs> and in the end, we, we fell to you know a guide that could take us, because you cannot go in that, around that country without a guide, a, a well, a very experienced guide. And they are used to taking people around for very different purpose. So we ended up falling into the Trobian tribes, which are very well known for their rather erotic dances, and everybody loves going there. Um, and, you know, yes, there was this di difficulty of us and them, uh, definitely. But since this project has initiated and we've had our first round of expeditions, we ended up um, in French Polynesia, which was a very different place because it was, we started off in the capital and, and within two days met just a whole cross section from high officials in the government to, you know, the independentists, independentists, you know, and everybody in between. And of course, all the narrative of, of, of also things that we've researched before, such as the nuclear test, and we were there on the 50th anniversary of that. So there was that narrative. There was a rising sea water narrative and dealing with going to the atolls. So we were far better prepared already. This led us to going to the IUCN conference, where we've now met heads of state from nearly all the countries we want to travel to in the next wave and have introductions to all the universities we've started making the ways I mean just having you here Linz because of all of your relationship also to all the marine sanctuaries and, and all the work that people are doing uh, from the traditional Rahui to you know Pew Charitable Trust whatever and all of a sudden, so many things are unfolding in front of us. It's nearly now we have l'embarras du choix to try and, and prepare, you know, our massive reading list that we give to people before they come. You know, the, the strategy of what are the things we're going to focus on, there's where we're going to go. And again, as you said, uh, the difficulty of rushing from one island to the next because there's so much to see in Papua New Guinea. It's tragic to come all the way there and not rush around and, and go and see as much as possible. But in, in, in we've been also learning through our own mistakes, you know, like let's just stop trying to see everything um, and let's focus on the makeup of the narrative, at least what investigations we are entering into, what do we need and where do we need to go to unfold those and how much time do we need in each place to sort of reflect on these things and engage with the local community in a much more, and, and, and then start going deeper down. And I'm sure that on the, right now it might seem that it's all on the surface. But, you know, we've been, this is a complete experiment, not only in, in form, but in, in action. And, and conceptually it is, you know, throwing obviously, you know, it looked like we were just throwing cameras around and capturing whatever and seeing what we make of it. I mean, some of it was very, very specific, some were very determined, very clear. Um, and some things you want to do at the time and then it doesn't work out afterwards because the, you, you're subjecting yourself to sort of uncontrolled and unpredictable circumstances. You don't know how people are going to react. I mean, I can only give you an example. We went with. Um, um, Thomas Saraceno to the Solomon Islands and he brought his own team of scientists from MIT and people with him and you know had, we only had one day of good weather so there was only one day of flying one of those balloons uh, I would call them balloons flying sculptures that flew only through solar energy and um, the community came out and the interaction with the community was just absolutely extraordinary how important it was for them and how interesting it was for them and how much they learned and the sharing and you know, it's really not a one-way street the way you describe it it you know it's it's a bit judgmental the way maybe you you may have phrased your question 
and I'm just going to fight back a bit here because you know I, I mean, we're exposing all of this unprepared material for for an objective and uh, open to criticism. Don't get me wrong, but um, this is also a learning process for us all. And I can only say in one year we've opened up a Pandora's box. You know, I don't think there's anybody out there right now that is challenging themselves with this level of, of exposure and, and, and curiosity as well. And, you know, then at the same time, the pressure on everybody to perform, you know, a convening within six months um, and actually choosing Kochi as, a, as, a, as we know, a very demanding audience and a very sophisticated one as well. So, you know, let it give us a chance. We are obviously looking at and have been in contact with great artists from India who are participating in the program as well. I just think it's, um, what we get this offer, it's a very generous offer, of course, when one does not ever have this opportunity to invite five people to go with you on such a journey. And, um, on one hand, it's a very generous offer, but it's not like that one just jumps on it, because, like, it's I'm not an ocean person, I don't know much about the sea, it's a really an urban land. And to, but it, it's so unusual. So sometimes I think it's, for example, for me, I function best to a certain degree in alienation when I'm not familiar with the context, when I don't know how to react. And I think to go on the road with the donor, with the supporter, and with your fellows is already a very unusual situation. You know it's a very privileged situation. We didn't, I, I didn't know even that uh, Cesar chose the location. I, I said to Mark, why Papua? Why Papua New Guinea? I mean, like, this is almost like the cliche of where you want to go on an expedition. And he said, okay, why not? Like, let's just go with it. Let's see what it unfolds. I took also one of my PhD students who left his country, his home, I guess, um, from the north of Sri Lanka, in Tamil. They escaped on a boat in, in the middle of the fight of Tamil Tigers. Like, he cannot swim. So it was not like that. He said, oh, yeah, let's go there. He was really very hesitant. But as his PhD deals with the global harbors and new developments of uh, Chinese, in, huge Chinese infrastructures around 56 harbors globally, I said, like, you, it's important you go into the ocean. It's, I think it's important you join. So I think this kind of dialogues and experiences are very important. I also asked uh, two artists I knew, like Uwe Harry, for example, he worked in Vanuatu for more than 10 years with the population. I said, I cannot just go there. Or Laura and Miss Babata, she works with uh, Yamamami since more than 25 years. And again, like they would give complete opposite advice of what I have, that would have done instinctively. So you have to, you, to a certain degree, you have to leave, as you said, your books at home because you, they, they don't function. At one point anymore, they don't give you a grid, and you have to overcome yourself to a certain degree. And I think you might think, oh, wow, this is some happy rich people who are going through self experience or so. But it, it, of course, we are more intelligent than that, and drives you further. So I just want to say it, it ended up somewhere very differently than I thought it would go. Because, of course, you start, you are getting serious, you want to do the follow ups, you don't need it just that. That. And I think it developed in a very different direction than we anticipated in the beginning. Yeah, I'm not, um, it's not no. my criticism or my question is not really about the mission or about the journey or about, I mean, of course, it's a huge project and, you know, it's, um, it's it, uh, my, my questions were not actually relating to the, to the trip at right. all. It was more in relation to the work um, and some of these terms, you know. Uh, I thought that because these are questions around filmmaking or around representation that I think, uh, you know, whether they happen on the boat, whether they happen, you know, in Kochi, or whether they happen anywhere else. I mean, these are not, I'm not, it's not a, it's not a question of the mission as such, it's more about the, the these terms that these things are going to be raised. So and I'm glad that the question was brought up because I think for us it's been a little bit, like, like I said, it's trying to find this midpoint between 
how do you create a mechanism that works for you, but being very aware that just even our own presence, they're like inevitably thinking about representation and us pulling on cameras, and we have material to share, we have these convenings in which we have to present, does, I mean, it, it made me uncomfortable. I know that we have these, but at some point it's figuring out how to operate within this. So I'm glad you brought the question because I think it's something that like, I know a lot of my fellows, both the previous ones and the ones that are coming, like, like Cotter and Otobong, have asked about these exact same things already before even you know, stepping onto the boat. So I think it's definitely a conversation that we're collectively trying to sort of figure out um, and work through. Thank you for your comments and questions. Thank you. And, and I know we're out of time, but I'd like to leave with a quote by, a quote that I've just uh, uh, came across again after several years um, by Trinity Mina. With the look is a three-way imperfection developed between the subject observed, the subject observing, and the tools for observation. The encounter is likely to resonate in strangely familiar and unpredictable ways. The translator transforms while being transformed. Imperfection thus leads to new realms of exploration and traveling as a practice of bold omission and minute depiction allows one to shamelessly hybridize as one shuttles back and forth between critical blindness and critical insight. And I think that kind of sums up our, uh, the, at least the propeller groups kind of rethinking about our, our participation in this and, and, and how we travel and how to explore. Thank you all for your comments. <laughs>